Well, I want to thank the Historical Society for the invitation to speak on this subject. Uh, it is a topic that is both ancient and modern, and I guess it's true to say uh, a topic that all of us will have an opinion on uh, in one way or another. Speaking about one aspect of worship, John Wesley said, Above all, sing spiritually. Have an eye to God in every word you sing. Aim at pleasing him more than yourself or any other creature. Well, I hope that our consideration of this subject this evening will be done in that spirit with an eye to God in every thought and word. I want to begin this evening by making a few comments about a common vocabulary, a common vocabulary. Worship is a term in regular usage and especially in the sphere of religion. It's also used, you will know, from time to time in the secular sphere uh, with reference to a dignitary of high standing. For example, a magistrate or a mayor of a town or city. But most commonly, it is a religious word which features, of course, in all of the great world religions indicating honour and reverence being given to a deity. In the second place, it's very important to recognize what I've called a common misunderstanding. In the contemporary Christian church, a development in usage of this term worship has occurred. In the past, people spoke about attending worship. And what they meant by that, of course, was going to a place of worship or attending a, a church service. But nowadays, the word has acquired something of a more specific meaning, referring solely to praise or singing, so that there are many people in church today who understand worship to mean the songs and hymns uh, that we sing, so that sometimes you hear about people moving from one church to another because, quote, there is better worship there. And what they mean is they prefer the musicians, the songs that are sung, uh, the band leader or whatever. Now, this is a common misunderstanding uh, about this term worship, and I will return to that a little bit later in the lecture. One other feature of the discussion, which is worth mentioning right at the outset, is that there is now a body of literature that has begun to emerge on the subject, both at the popular and academic levels. In addition, modules and whole courses can now be accessed on the theme of worship, including, let me say, and this is a, a brief word of promotion, our own master's module at the Irish Baptist College on the theology of worship. Now, right at the end, I'm going to put up on the screen uh, some recommendations about uh, resources that you will be able to find on this theme and I've given you a sample of those in hard copy here on this desk. They're not for taking away, I'm sorry they're not free. Some of them are my own personal copies and uh, you'll be electrocuted the minute you try to take them out the door. Uh, others are from the library so uh, just have a look at them afterwards, take a photograph if you want and those are the kind of resources uh, that you'll be able to get. Now our task then this evening in this lecture is to examine the theology of worship from a historical perspective and draw out some reflections from that for the contemporary church. This will necessarily call for some brief treatment of relevant biblical texts, but the main thrust of our lecture will nevertheless be historical in focus. In addition, at the outset, I want to set, uh, to set out a basic controlling parameter. And that is that whilst I am fully aware that worship is classically understood as the whole of life lived for God. For the purposes of our lecture this evening, we're going to limit ourselves to the matter of the public corporate worship of the people of God. So I think it's important to make that uh, qualification of all that we're about to do this evening. Now, there are, of course, a great many definitions of worship in the literature, but the one that I think captures it particularly well, or at least one of the definitions that uh, captures my imagination, is this one by Bloch in his 2014 Biblical Theology of Worship. He says, true worship involves rever reverential human acts of submission and homage before the divine sovereign in response to his gracious revelation of himself himself 
and in accord with his will. I think that bears repetition. True worship involves reverential human acts of submission and homage before the divine sovereign in response to his gracious revelation of himself and in accord with his will. Now with that, uh, which I think is a useful starting point thinking about the subject, let's commence in the most appropriate place with a consideration of worship in the Old Testament. The terminology that is used in Scripture incorporates three sets of terms. Now, I approach this particular element of the lecture with some confidence because I, I, I've traced a good deal of the material in the next few minutes uh, to my esteemed colleague, Dr. Dalrymple, who helps uh, me in the teaching of this module along with others. And uh, so any questions in the Old Testament then can be addressed, obviously, to Sarah this evening. Uh, the terminology used in Scripture incorporates three <coughs> sets of terms. First of all, worship as homage and adoration to God. The idea is of the acknowledgement of someone great, of someone to be honored, of the giving of a salutation. For example, in Psalm 95, the psalmist says, let us humble ourselves before God. You see, worship as homage or adoration to God. A second set of terms concern service to God. These are taken up and applied in Scripture to the relationship between Israel and her king or between Israel as children responding to God as their father. And I think a good example of that is found in Exodus 3 verse 12 uh, where it says, You shall serve God on this mountain. And that's an act of worship, that service for God. It's another uh, set of terms that are used to describe the worship of old, the Old Testament saints. The third set of terms is our concern, worship as respect, reverence, and fear. Very notable in this connection is Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, which says, To fear God and keep his commandments is the whole duty of man. To fear God and keep his commandments is the whole duty of man. Now, apart from these three sets of terms, which I think are a very good starting point when you're thinking about worship in the Old Testament, you also need to bear in mind that there is a constant depiction in the Old Testament of a contrast. And that contrast is between true and false worship in terms of its object, its place, its focus, and its activities. So we know as we read that the nations worship gods of wood and stone in multiple places, using altars and images, doing what was right in their own eyes. But by contrast, God's people were to worship Yahweh in a single location, enjoying the blessing of his presence and worship, worshiping him in the way that he commanded. So there is this very striking contrast between true and false worship in the Old Testament records. Now, early references to singing by the congregation of Israel include Exodus 15, the Song of Moses following the crossing of the Red Sea, and Deuteronomy 31, where Moses is instructed to, quote, write this song and teach it to the people of Israel, chapter 31, 19. Later in the Pentateuch, Following the giving of the Sinai Covenant, Moses gives detailed regulations for Israelite worship at the tabernacle and eventually the temple in, for example, the book of Leviticus. I think of chapter 23 uh, in that connection. However, while there are many references to the temple in the Psalter, for example, in Psalms 42 and 43, Yet, Scripture does not specify how the Psalms are to be used in worship. And outside of the Psalter itself, very little is said about the role of Psalms in Israel's worship. If you want a little bit more of a picture of clarity about what worship looked like uh, in the Old Testament context, then you really need to go to Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah. Uh, the book of Chronicles, the books of Chronicles, offer many details about temple worship. 
For example, 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 8 forwards, indicates that the Ark of the Covenant arrived in Jerusalem and was marked by thanksgiving songs using texts that are corresponding, if you like, to Psalm 105. So here is uh, praise being offered to God for the arrival of the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem. And the singers are reflecting uh, on uh, other scripture and the book of Psalms 105, for example. Then the books of Ezra and Nehemiah give glimpses into worship in the 5th century B.C., where, for example, at the dedication of the fortifications of Jerusalem, two choirs with accompanying instruments walked around the newly rebuilt wall. Nehemiah 12:27. So if you want a picture then of what worship looked like in the Old Testament, you, you need to think about this, what's on the slide here, as an overview. There are three sets of terms that are used to describe it there on the left-hand side. There is this striking contrast between the true and the false worship. There are examples of songs being sung in the, to, to the praise of God. And if you want something of a little bit more detail in terms of a picture of it, then go to 1 and 2 Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah. And I think the thing to remember about all of this is most specifically that God is at the center both in the terminology that is, that is employed and the responses that are involved. We move in the second place to think about the worship of the first Christians. Paul's references to the Psalms in Colossians 3.16 and Ephesians 5.19 are a good place to start. So you know this text, I'm sure, Colossians 3.16, sing Psalms, hymns and spiritual songs the Apostle says. Now, the implication of these texts, at least, is that the practice of psalm singing seems to have been current among Christian believers. I don't think that that's actually very surprising because it is clear from accounts of the apostolic mission in the first century Greco-Roman world, Jewish communities could be found in most cities. So we think about, uh, in that connection, Pisidia, Acts 13, and Thessalonica in Acts 17. It is estimated, scholars say, that Jews comprised about one-seventh of the population of most Mediterranean cities. Therefore, despite the fact of considerable discontinuity between Jewish tradition and Christian ideology with regard to matters, for example, of ritual purification and food laws, yet... Jesus was a Jew, and so were his earliest followers. It is consequently important not to overemphasize the contrast regarding worship and recognize that a range of Jewish concepts and practices underlie Christian worship right through to modern times. And so one of the authors of a book here that's on the table, uh, a man called White, says, Christians may have turned the world upside down, but in the form and content of their worship, it was still recognizably a Jewish world. They may have turned the world upside down, but in the form and content of their worship, it was still recognizably a Jewish world. Now, six features are worthy of note when you think about the worship of the first Christians. Firstly, the notion of the centrality of Scripture. It was the Jewish custom to read and comment on the Scriptures, especially from the Pentateuch and the Prophets. And this was something that was taken up and carried on by the Apostles. In, for example, uh, those early verses in Acts 17, where the Apostle arrives in Thessalonica. Secondly, the importance of prayer was emphasized very keenly by, by both Jews and Christians in worship. Acts 1.14 indicates that the first believers assembled for the observance of daily prayer. Now, there is a bit of speculation about this among the, the various scholars, that at first, some argue these meetings may have mirrored the observance of other Jews who followed a daily schedule. But it's very clear 
if that is so, nevertheless, it's very clear that the Christians soon formed their own assemblies and patterns. And there is a suggestion based on a document known as the Didache, which is an early Christian summary of doctrine, that the Lord's Prayer should be recited three times a day, implying that a regular cycle of prayers was in place. And I'll say something in connection with another time period a little bit later about that business of a regular cycle. The third feature of the worship of the first Christians was the observance of the Lord's Supper. It is apparent that the celebration of the supper in the infant churches was in the context of a meal, and that the separation of the two was already becoming evident at the beginning of the second century. On the question of frequency, which is a, an interesting interdenominational discussion, on the question of frequency, there is perhaps suggestion of a weekly observance in the biblical text. And I would point to Acts 20 verse 7 for that. And also incidentally, or maybe more than incidentally, in the writings of secular writers of the period, such as Pliny, they emphasize that the Christians met together on a weekly basis. Patristic writers like Justin Martyr speak of the Eucharist. Don't be frightened by that word, Baptists. It simply means a thanksgiving. We're nervous about it because other people use it in a different way, but it means a thanksgiving. And Justin Martyr says uh, the Eucharist occurs for the Christians on the day called Sunday. Now, there were one or two other features of uh, consideration and discussion about this. One was the eschatological orientation of the supper. Uh, this was to be celebrated until he comes, thinking about the future. And the other issue that, uh, of course, became a major area of debate and concern was the question of the real presence of Christ in the elements, vigorously debated at the time of the Reformation in particular. So the Lord's Supper was observed. That's a, a very prominent feature of the worship of the first Christians. Fourthly, a set time developed a set time developed, a tendency to introduce daily schedules in worship became observable early on and found its roots in the pattern of the Old Testament and New Testament. And, and so at this point, I'm taken back to a little song we used to sing uh, in youth fellowship. Uh, Daniel was a man of prayer. Can you finish it? Daily he prayed three times. And of course, the text is Daniel 6 verse 10. And also, here's one, Psalm 119, verse 164. Seven times a day, the psalmist says, I praise you. The reality of Christian public worship being conducted on the first day of the week is clearly based on the resurrection occurring on the first day of the week. The outcome of this was that the Corinthians, for example, were encouraged to make their offering on the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, and the Apostle John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, Revelation 1, verse 10. And extra biblical literature, I referred to the Didache uh, a little while ago. The Didache, section 14, stresses that believers should come together, quote, on this special day and give thanks. So uh, a set time developed for worship. And uh, when we think about that in the uh, the, the worship of the, the early Christians, the first Christians, then we think particularly about the Lord's Day and the development of that. Fifthly, music had a definite role. Now, on this point, it is difficult to be definitive regarding the role of music and singing among the first Christians, except to note several places where the singing of hymns is mentioned. I give you Acts 16.25, Ephesians 5.19, and that text again from Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Pliny states that the Christians, you may be familiar with this quotation, sang a hymn to Christ as to a God. And of course, in the book of Revelation, singing is a feature of the worship of the heavenly church. We are given a new song to sing, chapter 5, verse 9, Revelation 14, verse 3. And the heavenly company, incidentally, are holding musical instruments. Chapter 5, verse 8, 
and 15 verse 2. I look forward to that. I gave up music at uh, grade 2 and uh, my piano playing is appalling now, so uh, wouldn't that be wonderful to be able to play an instrument in glory? In addition, a selection of hymn texts appear in the New Testament. So you've got that famous uh, Christ hymn in Philippians 2 from 6 to 11. There also are hymn texts in other places, for example, Ephesians 5.14, which appears to be a verse of something that the early Christians were singing. The text went like this, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. I said that quite loudly, just in case the heat in the room was affecting anyone. Uh, but can you imagine singing that verse? Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. It's recorded there in Ephesians 5.14. And it appears to be part of an early Christian hymn. And then, of course, songs are found in the mouths of some of the prominent figures in the nativity stories. And we've got Elizabeth, Mary, and Simeon, who all sing praise to God in Luke 1 and Luke 2. And I said there were six, so here's the sixth one. The worship of the first Christians was explicitly Trinitarian becoming increasingly inclusive of New Testament texts with a strong focus on the centrality of Jesus Christ as Lord. Incorporating a shift away from the physical temple and the move from Sabbath to Lord's Day. Now, where do you find this most accentuated in the New Testament? Well, the answer is, of course, the book of Hebrews, where the supremacy of Jesus is the central theme. Jesus better than angels. Jesus better than the Old Testament sacrifices. Jesus better than everything is the emphasis of Hebrews. And so David Peterson, uh, in uh, one of Carson's books, says this, What is striking about the New Testament is that Jesus is explicitly worshipped and that the theological impulses of the New Testament documents draw Old Testament strands into them so that Jesus is now the temple, the priest, the Passover lamb, and the bread of life. So the centrality of Jesus is so important in the framework of the, the, the Godhead of the Trinity. Their worship was explicitly Trinitarian. So worship in the Old Testament, the worship of the first Christians. And then we jump forward a, a, a good few years to worship in the Middle Ages. One writer, Michael Driscoll, in the Oxford History of, the Christian, of Christian Worship, which is here, states that the medieval history of Europe can be told from a liturgical point of view. Now, whenever we use the term Middle Ages, we're thinking, broadly speaking, of the years 500 to 1200 AD. That's a, a broad approach to the Middle Ages. And whenever we employ the term Christian in connection with these years, we're thinking very broadly. We're not thinking of Irish Baptists, let me say, at this point. We're thinking about Christendom which included at that time the Roman Catholic Church, which in that period had risen to a position of dominance in the Western world. So the chief characteristic of worship in the Middle Ages was this, the development of liturgy. Set prayers, readings, and songs, primarily connected to the sacraments. Pope Gregory the Great, well, that was what he was called, uh, that was the title that was given to him, Pope Gregory the Great, who died in 604 AD, lent his name to several liturgical books. Some of them were used in the celebration of the Mass, and some in the reform of liturgical music. And so maybe if you're familiar with this, you will have heard of Gregorian chant, uh, which emanates from Pope Gregory's work. In the Middle Ages, another feature of worship was a developing uniformity in practice in which the ministry of the priest became the key focus in worship and the role of the laity or the common people was removed to the periphery. Even the music employed became increasingly professional with trained singers and choirs relieving the laity of any sense of responsibility. Theologically, the idea of God as a stern and distant judge 
became prominent in this period. And what that led to was an emphasis on penance and monasticism, which marked, quote, all that is highest in the search for acceptance with God. Monastic piety came to the fore with a stress on cycles of liturgy and the practice of self-denial and uh, mortification of the body. And, and all of that, of course, which is very alien uh, to what we are accustomed to, all of that set the scene for a revolution in worship that took place in the Reformation. And so we, th uh, we turn to think then about worship in the Reformation. The period 1500 to 1700 saw dramatic changes in the churches of the Western world. The Protestant Reformation, born out of protest against Roman Catholic abuses and what the Reformers saw as the sterile atmosphere of medieval worship, brought in its wake massive implications for the theology and practice of public worship. Here are some of the main concerns that the Reformers had. First of all, they were concerned to reject the Mass. Against the Roman Catholic notion of a repeated sacrifice and the doctrine of transubstantiation, in other words, that the substance uh, of the, the bread and wine becomes literally the body and blood of the Lord Jesus, transubstantiation. For Luther, this was an appalling abuse it brought, he said, an endless host of other evils in its wake. Things like intercessions, merits, memorial days, all for purchase from which priests and monks derived a living. So the reformers were passionate about the rejection of the mass. They were also passionate about the declericalization of prayer. Moving away from what had been heretofore something prominent in the, in the medieval age, and that was away from public liturgy to private recitation. So less emphasis, in other words, on responsive prayers and a new focus, which came actually, became actually more acute uh, with the, uh, the, the rise of Puritanism on the Christian home as a little church where there was the family altar and, and uh, uh, prayer and scripture reading was encouraged at home. So a move away from the cycle of liturgy, uh, the declericalization of prayer and the importance of the role of the laity. Thirdly, they were concerned about the diminution in significance of dates and days. Luther sought to keep major festivals in line with the major events of the Gospels. He had a particular aversion to what were known as, in those days, Feasts of the Holy Cross, popular in Roman Catholicism. Anglicans were especially conservative on these matters, uh, notably in the Revised Prayer Book of 1552. White says, in the volume that's over here on the table, Scots and Puritans denied these feasts as human inventions, for which they said there was absolutely no scriptural, uh, no scriptural warrant. But, says White, they more than made up for it with their strict observance of the Lord's Day as the Christian Sabbath. And so I think there's a little tongue-in-cheek comment uh, from White at that point. But the Reformers in the main uh, were concerned about the diminution of dates and days. In other words, don't misunderstand what I just said. They, they wanted the diminution of dates and days. Number four, they were passionate about preaching, the increased significance of preaching. A renewed awakening in the vitality of this was the chief hallmark of the Reformation. In Wittenberg, for Luther, there were three sermons on Sunday and daily throughout the week. In Geneva, Calvin was busy preaching every Sunday and also during the week, and there was a tremendous emphasis on congregational praise. Now, I think it's important to make that last point, because sometimes the Reformers are seen as gloomy, introverted, and against everything that could possibly be joyful. This is a complete misunderstanding of the Reformation period. There was a great emphasis on congregational praise, but preaching was right at the heart of 
And the sermon was seen, for example, in Calvin's Geneva as the high point of worship when God speaks and man believes and responds. The Genevan people heard preaching, as I say, several times weekly. And so MacNeil, one of the commentators on this period, says, Here was in Geneva a new generation arising, catechized, trained in the scriptures, a community well indoctrinated and disciplined. Don't understand that term indoctrinated negatively, please, because it simply meant that they were well versed in doctrine. Anglicans too saw the importance of preaching. So Archbishop Cranmer published model sermons in 1547, and he was followed by eloquent preachers in Andrews, Dunn, and Taylor. The increased significance of preaching. And then fifthly, there was an explosion in the use of music. I hope that's not uh, an overstatement. But Luther saw singing as one of God's greatest gifts He's credited with approximately 37 hymns. We sang one of them here in the college the other day. Isn't that right, Andrew? And uh, I think a lack of familiarity with it spoiled it a little bit, but we'll do it again uh, and we'll get there next time. Swingley, however, banned all music and song in public worship. Why did he do that? Well, it appears because of his very high view of Scripture. Nothing should interfere with Scripture. Calvin held a compromised position. Music was welcome so long as the words were scriptural. The Anabaptists went beyond this, and they encouraged singing, even if not based on any particular passage of Scripture. Well, where did it all finish? The Calvinist position became the norm in the Church of England, for example, and led to the default position being the singing of metrical psalms, which only began to change when Isaac Watts began to write hymns at the close of the 17th century. So this then is a, a sketch, an overview of worship in the Reformation. Now, there's so much that I'm, I'm not saying, obviously, but uh, the subject is vast, so I'm, I'm hopefully giving you something to latch on to here. Now, we move at that point then to Baptist worship, and I want to think about this in three particular trajectories. First of all, the Anabaptists. An examination of early Anabaptist worship shows both dependence upon and distinction from the worship of the mainline Reformation churches of the 16th century. The common core was the centrality of the scriptures. But their radical distinctives in ecclesiology had a marked effect upon Anabaptist worship. So what do I mean by that? Well, Anabaptists had what we call an exclusivist understanding of the church. Their ecclesiology, doctrine of the church, was an exclusivist position. In that, only those who professed to know the Lord and whose lives bore out their profession were baptized, welcomed to the Lord's table, and included in the membership and worship activities of the church. Now, the opposite to that, it was in contradiction to an inclusivist approach of the mainline churches with their doctrine of infant baptism, arguably leading to a mixed multitude understanding of church life. So let me give you a couple of snippets from uh, two or three of the Anabaptists. One, Dirk Phillips, includes in his instructions about the Lord's Supper a repeated emphasis upon the necessity of a regenerate congregation. He says, this is a church ordinance and not an individual activity. It should be preceded by personal examination and repentance, and it ought to issue into encouragement and service one member of another. The question of hymn singing among the Anabaptists was one that, in which there was a great deal of divergence. Uh, early Anabaptists differed on this. Conrad Grable, whose name may be familiar to you in Anabaptist thinking, wrote to one Thomas Munster chastising him for introducing new German hymns. He says this, this cannot be for the good. Nothing like this is taught in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, he says, very clearly forbids singing in Colossians 3.16 because he says they are to speak 
to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And so he's interpreting that text very woodenly uh, and very literally. He's saying, it, it, Paul was simply saying, just speak to one another, but he wasn't saying anything about singing. That's Conrad Grable. Another, Peter Reedman, uh, on the other hand, encourages singing in the Spirit to the praise of God. It ought to be, he says, of service to men. Spiritual songs do this. They attract and move men to blessedness. However, a word of caution from Reedman. He says, believers should be careful that they do not engage in singing merely for carnal joy or for the sweet sound or for some such reason. So I, I'm not sure how that must have been then in the, in the church in which he was a member. Uh, you weren't allowed to make a joyful noise or a sweet sound. And in my case, I would have fitted very well into that congregation. So uh, I hope you can see from that brief sketch that there was a considerable degree of fluidity in the conduct of and involvement in worship among the Anabaptists. Secondly, in this uh, particular section, we need to think about the English Baptists briefly. In the 17th century, much separatist worship, and the Baptists at that time were separatists, was conducted in secret because of the very real threat of persecution. Now, particular Baptists, they were the Calvinistic Baptists, tended to follow the pattern of other Calvinistic groups, independents and Presbyterians, rather than the more radical approach of the general Baptists. They were the more Arminian group. And this pattern, according to Ellis, was, uh, if I can just list the, the, the elements, prayer, Old Testament reading, New Testament reading, a psalm, prayer before the sermon, the sermon itself, then intercessory prayer, the Lord's prayer, another psalm, and the blessing at the end. That was the pattern uh, for many of these early Baptist churches in the English context. Now, Baptist worship in the 18th century followed much the same pattern as that. And then into the 19th century, prayer, praise, reading, preaching continued to be commonplace. So for about uh, three centuries, 16, 17, 18, on into 19, uh, there was this particular pattern. By the 20th century, Baptist worship had settled into what is sometimes referred to as the hymn sandwich. You familiar with this? Hymn reading, hymn prayer, notices and offering, hymn sermon, hymn benediction. The hymn sandwich, you see, all these different layers, but punctuated by hymns. The period since the 1950s has seen the most rapid developments in Baptist worship with a considerable increase in diversity. In some places in the English setting, a more liturgical style is evident, and I think that's probably through the influence of some English Baptist theologians. Uh, I'm thinking of people like Paul Fides uh, and Anthony Cross. At the same time, charismatic renewal has had an impact, leading to a pattern of, broadly speaking, and this is not exact, but broadly speaking, worship time, which is a sequence of songs, sometimes with prayers, uh, the sermon, usually preceded by scripture reading, and then after all of that, a ministry time. What's that about? Well, it's about prayer for people's individual needs, prayer for help and healing. This is a structure which in some ways resembles later American revivalism to, to some degree. So the English Baptists. And then the Irish Baptists. For most of their history, Irish Baptists have been characterized by a reasonably traditional approach to public worship. The hymn sandwich alluded to earlier has been a feature of the worship of many of our churches. And I think it's fair to say that the use of psalmody has been virtually unknown, virtually unknown. The Baptist hymn book published in 1963 by the Baptist Union of Great Britain and the old Irish Baptist hymn book published in 1965, as far as I can ascertain, was the staple diet of several of our churches alongside revivalist hymn books. And I'm thinking back to my own experience. We used that Irish Baptist uh, hymn book and redemption songs in the evening. Uh, that was the pattern in, in quite a few of our churches. What was the musical accompaniment? Well, for a long time in my experience, and I go back a long time, the use of an organ, 
And then we became extremely radical and we had a piano playing alongside the organ. Uh, that was the common accompaniment. But in more recent years, the development of contemporary praise songs, the demise of hymn books, and the emergence of worship leaders and bands have been characteristic. So then, worship in the Old Testament, the worship of the first Christians, worship in the Middle Ages and the Reformation, the worship of the Baptists, and then finally, and I say that, use that term advisedly, it's not quite finally yet, but anyway, we're getting near there. Uh, finally, a consideration of modern worship. Now, a little bit of setting of the context here. From the time of the Enlightenment, the supremacy of reason has been presupposed in virtually every sphere of thought. So what was characteristic of the Enlightenment? Well, a questioning of everything that previous generations had accepted by way of authority. So politics, science, religion, uh, all of these things are up for grabs. They're questioned. And worship in the context of the church has not escaped the ramifications of this trend. White, in his excellent book, identifies the Methodist frontier and Pentecostal traditions as indicative of this move away from an objective orientation to a more subjective kind of approach. Uh, he identifies Methodism in this connection as part of a reaction to the Enlightenment agenda, insisting, as it did, and to some degree still does, on the importance of feeling and heart religion inspired by hymn singing. So, features then of the modern period. First of all, public prayer. In the modern period, this thrived in the Anglican setting through a fairly regimented use of the prayer book and the introduction in the Victorian era of choirs to sing morning and the evening prayers. In Roman Catholicism, if I can refer to that, public prayer remained the monopoly of the clergy. Until 1965, and you may know what happened then, the, the uh, 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 pronouncements, if that's the right term, of Vatican II happened in 1965, when uh, uh, there was an encouragement of the recitation of prayers also by the laity. How interesting. That was one of the things that the reformers were passionate about, the declericalization of prayer. And in 1965, there was something of a move. How successful that was or has been uh, is another question. Methodists were instrumental in encouraging corporate prayer in groups. And out of this grew, at first in America, the midweek prayer meeting. And so Baptists didn't invent that. It was something that emerged uh, in uh, Methodism and American revivalism. So public prayer. Secondly, of course, preaching. A preaching service became the norm for much of the English-speaking Reformed and Puritan tradition. In Methodism, it evolved from the Anglican morning prayer service with a sermon added. One writer says, at a time when the average Anglican sermon consisted of 15-minute doses of morality, Wesley and Whitfield transformed the significance of preaching as they brought their message to the masses beyond the confines of church buildings. And read the history uh, of Wesley and Whitfield and how they made such a, a remarkable impact on the masses beyond the confines of church buildings. In the more contemporary context, a revival of preaching has arguably taken place with the Ministry of Proclamation Trust in the UK and Ireland and the Gospel Coalition and Together for the Gospel uh, in the USA. Now, I can't fail to, uh, to miss saying this, but Irish Baptists have also been consistently at the forefront of the promotion of preaching. And this is due in no small measure to the prominence of the homiletical task in the teaching of the Irish Baptist College. So I thought I might blow our own trumpet at that point, uh, just for a moment. So public prayer, secondly, preaching features of worship in the modern period, thirdly, music. The singing of what had been perceived by the Puritans as uninspired hymns now blossomed under Charles Wesley. Uh, 
who wrote uh, some 6,500 hymns with largely solid doctrinal content. I'm not saying that that's uh, universally so. The influence of Johann Sebastian Bach in the 18th century cannot be discounted in terms of his influence on choral pieces and organ music. In the 19th century, hymnody, hymnody became more subjective with an emphasis on feeling more than the mighty acts of God. And then in the contemporary scene, Christian songs today have a, a great tendency towards more subjectivity. With the rise of the worship leader influencing how music is understood and used in the worship of the church. And so what is sometimes called, and you'll find this phrase used in a number of the, the pieces of literature here, uh, what is sometimes called the praise and worship movement has spread throughout North America, the UK, Ireland, and many other parts of the world. Some variation in terminology is observable in the descriptions of the phenomenon. However, in practice, confusion is apparent in the identification of singing as worship almost exclusively. Now, I did say I'd return to this point, and here I am. In a great many churches today, you may hear the musicians thanked for leading us in worship, when what they have actually done is to lead us in praise, which is a component of worship. The elements of public worship are what? Bible reading, prayer, singing, I'd say offering. There may be some difference in the audience here this evening about that. And the exposition of the word in preaching, which I think the reformers got spot on as saying it was the high point of worship when God speaks to us by his word. Now, this misunderstanding over the distinction between praise and worship has been in part produced by the development of what D.A. Carson calls the cult of the worship leader. It is arguable that the negative impact of the contemporary fixation on worship leaders could be addressed in part by the introduction of a variety of models of praise. From, for example, band uh, to instrumental, and maybe even choral. Wouldn't that be a shock? Some church of our churches, of course, uh, have uh, traditionally had choirs at certain times of the year, at, uh, maybe at Easter or, or at Christmas, uh, classically. And that has always been, it seems to me, a tremendous blessing uh, to our worship in the church. Uh, an example of this kind of variety of models of praise may be found in Redeemer Church in Manhattan in New York, which employs that kind of variety. And uh, if you uh, have a look, I'm stepping away from the camera at this point, but if you have a look at this book at some point, Worship by the Book by D.A. Carson, uh, there is a, a section in there by Tim Keller, uh, who is, I was going to say, or was the pastor uh, of that church. More fundamentally, Carson argues there needs to be a complete shift in thinking so that the notion of a worship leader who leads the singing is in his estimation to be avoided since this skews people's understanding and expectation as to what worship is. Now, that leads me, uh, and that may uh, be a, a topic that you might want to chew on a little bit in Q&A afterwards. That leads me to think uh, at this point about praise content. The content of what we sing in church has undeniably changed in the last 25 years. And I would argue it's not always for the better. The contemporary church is losing touch at an incredibly rapid pace with a, a vast range of hymnody, which has arguably impoverished our corporate worship. Now, in case you think I'm a, an ancient creature, this has not let me qualify an argument for the jettisoning of contemporary praise songs. I'm actually an enthusiast, but rather a plea for an approach employing the best of the old and the best of the new. I'm always amazed at how difficult we seem to find that balance to achieve it in local churches. Now, uh, let me say at this point, some modern songs, and I'm going to be even-handed about this, some modern songs are either trivial, 
or verging on heretical. Take for example, The Wonder of Your Cross by Robin Mark, which though in some measure is a very useful reflection on the passion of Christ, yet contains these lines. Were heaven's praises silent in those hours of darkness, your Holy Spirit brooding round that empty throne? It's mind-boggling. This is to say, at very least, a fundamental misunderstanding of the person and work of Christ. The throne in heaven was never at any time empty. And so I struggle whenever... Uh, we're singing that uh, in some of our churches. Or what about Michael Smith's song, Above All, which contains the words, Like a rose trampled on the ground, you took the fall and thought of me above all. I've always kind of found it difficult to put into uh, a sentence what I thought about that line. And then I read John Piper, who helped me greatly. He said this, <laughs> That's not helpful, says Piper, and I'm not even sure what it means. And I identify with that comment. Now, I said I'd be even-handed, and I will. There are some older hymns that can also have similar charges laid at their door. For example, and I hope this does not spoil Christmas for you, <laughs> but Away in a Manger <laughs> has the line, The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes, but little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. No, this is an expression of docetic theology, which is, I should ask students who are here, that Jesus only appeared to be a man. That's docetism. And so no crying he makes. Of course he cried. He was a fully human child. Sorry, we'll never be able to sing away in a manger again uh, after this. Uh, or what about this one at a baptismal service? At the cross, at the cross, by no less than Isaac Watts, one of my favorite hymn writers. He says this, At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away, <clears throat> it was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. <laughs> well, if anyone here tonight has actually experienced being happy all the day, Will you let me know afterwards and share your secret? So what, what do I think is the best approach? Well, I would recommend an approach that weaves together the best of the old and the new. The best of Wesley and Watts, the Gettys, Stuart Townend, the Sovereign Grace Stable, who are producing some absolutely marvelous songs. With some considered use of psalmody. Why are we so afraid of this? I think we ought to be singing some of these great psalms. That kind of blend is surely a more satisfactory pattern. Now what this means is that pastors and elders must not abdicate their responsibility in educating and closely liaising with musicians regarding themes. Also, those who lead praise need not only to be gifted in musical accompaniment and singing, but also be theologically aware and biblically rooted so that praise content becomes a key consideration in public worship. And I'm sure that you'll want to come back to me on some of these points. Now, we're finally at the conclusion. And I want to conclude by offering five controlling principles that ought to guide worship in the contemporary church. The first is... You'll not be surprised to hear scripture must rule. This must, most basic of principles will guide the thinking and the practice of our churches. Mark Ashton writes in one of Carson's books again, the church service should not just contain extracts from the Bible. It should be Bible driven. The church service should be Bible driven. That means that scripture must undergird all that we say and all that we sing in a given service of worship. So important. Secondly, services must connect. Ashton appeals for what he calls accessibility in worship. He traces this back, interestingly, to Archbishop Cranmer, who was determined to remove obscurity from church services and put simplicity and clarity in its place. So what does that mean for us? Well, I think it means some very simple things, very practical things. Our language needs to be contemporary. 
Our preaching needs to be relevant so that at the very least outsiders who come will take note that we are real people living in the 21st century, but with a timeless message. So scripture must rule, services must connect, third dignity must be observed. This was a, a prominent feature, for example, of the Genevan services of Calvin's day. Things were to be done decently and in order, which for the reformer, of course, was a pushback uh, against some of the extremes of the radicals as he saw them. Nowadays, it seems to me, not always, but sometimes, church services can be characterized by sloppiness and an almost irreverent sentimentality. In this, there appears to be little concern for excellence in music, song, speech, or preaching. I issue a quick qualification of that. This is not a contradiction of Paul's argument about against wise and persuasive words, as he writes to the Corinthians in the first chapter of his first letter to them. So when I say pursue excellence, I'm not talking about that wisdom of the Greeks or something like that. It's, it's simply an appeal to bring to God the best we have and not that which costs us nothing. Uh, and I think that's a reasonable uh, appeal to make. So dignity must be observed. Fourthly, conviction must motivate. We've all been to worship services where there has been a whipping up of emotions and we feel rightly uncomfortable about those excesses. On the other hand, we've also been to services where the sheer dullness and mediocrity of what is taking place has the most depressing effect on our spirit. Therefore, leaders and congregations need conviction. It's one of the things we're saying to our students here at the college. Uh, if you don't show their congregation that you really believe this stuff, why on earth would they believe it? You need to be someone who actually oozes conviction from every pore of your being. Leaders, congregations need this. Conviction about what? About God, his word, the Lord Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling us, the weighty importance of eternal realities. These things will motivate us in every element so that we worship God in spirit and in truth. Conviction must motivate. And then finally, Doxology must be the goal. I guess that could have really been put at the top, couldn't it? In Geneva, Calvin's aim in worship was to bring people face to face with God, he said, and to bring glory to him. Jonathan Edwards in Northampton has something beautiful to say, and I want to finish with this. Worship, he says, has not occurred simply when the external rites have been observed, but only, quote, when our hearts are affected and our love captivated by the free grace of God. Let me repeat that. He says, worship has not occurred simply when the external rites have been observed, but only when our hearts are affected and our love captivated by the free grace of God. Soli Deo Gloria must be the banner over all that we do in worship services in the church of Jesus Christ. Amen.